Tonight on the readout. It was a year of resilience, a year of care, a year of bravery, a year of pain, a year of hope, a year of endurance, a year of unity, the year of invincibility, the furious year of invincibility. Following a devastating year of Russia's war of aggression, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky vows to do everything to win this year. If Putin's goal was to devour Ukraine, he's clearly failed. And from the beginning, he's underestimated Ukraine and the West with severe consequences within Russia. And you might be following the Alex Murdoch murder trial. We're not going to get into all that testimony. Instead, I'm going to tell you about what this case tells us about generational power and privilege and the oligarchs living among us in America. And we begin tonight with the somber one-year anniversary of Russia's illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. The war remains the biggest threat to peace and security in Europe since the end of the Cold War. The scale of human suffering is unimaginable for so many. According to the United Nations, nearly 18 million people are in dire need of humanitarian assistance, and 14 million people are displaced from their homes. The repercussions continue to reverberate on a global scale as well, from a refugee and food crisis to unprecedented sanctions and higher inflation. And then, of course, there's the human cost. According to the U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights, at least 8,000 civilians are dead and 13,000 have been injured over the past 12 months. Yet Kyiv remains standing. A year into Putin's brutality, we must ask, how will this end? And what exactly can Russia hope to gain? Now, Putin gained territory, but then he lost it. According to the Institute of the Study of War, a Washington-based think tank, Russia controlled about 27 percent of Ukraine's landmass in the weeks after the invasion began a year ago. But in the second half of last year, a Ukrainian counteroffensive won back almost 29,000 square miles, including the key city of Kherson. That left Russia in control of about 18 percent of Ukraine's territory, 9 percent less than when they first invaded. If Russia's goal is to devour this country, it isn't happening. Quite the opposite, in fact. Ukraine is now po poised to get far more resources, including a $2 billion military aid package from the U.S. to help bolster Kyiv's war effort. Another key question, can Ukraine win this war or is it a stalemate? What we do know is that Russia is not winning the war. One of Moscow's goals was to beat back NATO, but NATO is bigger now. This week, Sweden's foreign minister said Sweden and Finland are firmly on course to join NATO, which will increase its membership from 30 to 32 countries before the year is out. The new members will also add more than 800 miles of land border with Russia, more than doubling the defensive bloc's existing borders. So what does Vladimir Putin do now? Putin, whose fate is tethered to a senseless brutality that has also killed or wounded 200,000 of his own soldiers. If neither side makes significant gains in the coming months, the conflict could well be heading for a stalemate, which no one wants. Ukraine says it wants all its land back, including Crimea, which was illegally annexed by Russia in 2014. Do they have the momentum to make that happen? Because if not, well, how else does this end? Joining me now from Kiev is MSNBC chief correspondent Ali Belshi and Malcolm Nance, a former U.S. naval intelligence officer who spent months fighting the Russians in Ukraine. And Ali, I do want to start with you, my friend. Um, let, let's talk about this, because you had a chance actually to throw a question to uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, to President Zelensky today. Uh, talk about that and talk about this press conference that he did today. Yeah, I did. A, it was a two hour long press conference with uh, international journalists here in Kiev. And, and that question you just asked, we could be headed for a stalemate. Then what happens? Nobody wants that to happen. So there are two views on this. One is Russia gets booted out of Ukraine, leaves and including uh, leaving Crimea. That's going to be a, a heavy lift. The other is that Russia makes advances. And if a year from now we're still in this position where this war is still going on, the, the president of Poland had said he worries that Russia will attack another state. So I put that question to President Zelensky. Listen to this conversation. Last week, the president of Poland had said that if this war is still going on one year from today, there is a real danger that an empowered Russia will invade another state. 
Given how effectively you have uh, held back a Russian advance with NATO's help here in Ukraine, is it even conceivable that, that Russia could invade another state, particularly a NATO state? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, I believe it's possible. And that might happen. Why? I can, I can give you an explanation. President Putin needs to demonstrate successes and victories. So there is not going to be a success uh, on the battlefield in Ukraine, and uh, he will not succeed with the massive revenge uh, in, in, in Ukraine. So he would need to demonstrate success. Uh, and that's the issue here, that, that what will what, what's Vladimir Putin's off-ramp here? What's his exit strategy? He hasn't he hasn't displayed one. I will say this, Joy, right now it's two in the morning here. The anniversary of the uh, the, the first anniversary of this war is officially over. And the week that many Ukrainians expected of missile barrages, rocket attacks and a new uh, a new Russian uh, launch, a uh, new Russian offensive has not yet materialized. I'm touching a lot of wood around here because we don't want to we don't want to talk about these things that haven't happened. But for whatever reason, Vladimir Putin didn't do what the world expected him to do this week. Uh, Malcolm, let me bring you in there because you were on the ground um, with Ukrainian forces. You've seen how how they fight, uh, how hard they're fighting for their country. What do you make of the fact that Putin did not launch the much expected offensive um, on the anniversary of the invasion? Well, I mean, he could have carried out a series of missile strikes on the cities, as he's been doing almost every day for the last year. But in terms of an offensive, which is actually a ground combat term moving out there, the Russians just don't have the combat capacity to do it. I've spent the last, oh, I was nine months in the Ukrainian army in the International Legion fighting the Russians. Uh, we knew that by September, when we carried out our counteroffensive in the Kharkiv area and then carried out another one in Kherson, that Russian combat power, really offensive power, is finished. I don't think Russia will ever be able to carry out anything of any significance over the next year. It doesn't matter if they bring up 500,000 mobilized men. All they are doing is just putting them into our sights. And that is why they are not carrying out a strike today. Putin is losing all of his capacity with to use precision weapons. There was a rumor he was going to use his Air Force in a devil-may-care a mass attack on Ukraine. The air defenses of Ukraine are so good right now that they're shooting down about 80 to 90 percent of the incoming, depending on the number of missiles that are coming in there. That's why we're not seeing anything today. Well, you know, Ali, you know, in talking about the situation here, Russia has really only succeeded in one thing, completely, completely isolating itself. I mean, there was a U.N. vote today uh, to, 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 to condemn Russia's invasion and to call for them to withdraw. The vote was 141 to 7. The only countries voting with Russia were Russia itself, Belarus, North Korea, Eritrea, Mali, Nicaragua and Syria. Uh, we do a whole <laughs> series of questions about that, 32 abstentions, including China. But on this question of stalemate, it's not as if Russia doesn't have an historical memory they can draw on about what stalemates look like and how they can be endless. North Korea is yes. a perfect example. That, that war started in 1950. Their own experience in Afghanistan, which they fought to a stalemate and got nothing from it but a humiliating withdrawal. Chechnya, again, this never-ending sort of stalemate this, and the grinding war in Syria. They, they have, you know, used their forces all over the region, all over the east, um, and they've not succeeded yet. Yes. And Afghanistan and Chechnya are both key examples because they went out for they went on for a long time. Uh, Afghanistan was at the fall of the so you know preceded the fall of the Soviet Union. So you know this was a, a a country that was broke and spending a lot of money. And all the news reports were about how their these guys in the hills were taking down their helicopters again with U.S. help. Those were uh, Stinger missiles being launched uh, that were provided by the United States, the Mujahideen. But the same thing happened in Chechnya. These these young Russian soldiers are coming home in body bags, and these parents are saying, "What exactly?" 
exactly are we fighting for again? What is this? Why are we there? And that's sort of the issue here in Ukraine. There are a lot of Russians who didn't give two hoots about Ukraine. They certainly weren't interested in taking it over. But Russia, like America, is subject to cable TV and propaganda and, of course, rules about what you can and can't say. You still can't call this a war in Russia. You can go to jail for doing that for 15 years. So there's a lot of brainwashing going on. There are a lot of people who can't explain why their prices are up, why their oil isn't getting sold, why they can't go to a McDonald's anymore, um, why they can't trade with other countries and, and buy things with their credit cards. Um, and, and, and everybody is starting to know somebody whose son or, you know, came back uh, in a body bag. Uh, but we don't know what happens to that. What changes in, in Russia? Is there enough of a movement? It's very hard. The, there is an opposition movement. There is a dissent movement in Russia. But it's very hard to, to gain ground because all of the dissent leaders are in jail uh, and they're yeah. imprisoning anybody else who questions this war. But that's the, the, that's why the institutional memory is not kicking in, because Vladimir Putin is ruling with an iron fist right now. Yeah, including our uh, friend of the show, Vladimir Karamurza, who was more, more recently um, in, imprisoned as well. I mean.